let's get this started. Hopefully lunch was delicious and people are uh, well fed and ready for an intense AI panel here. Um, so first off, uh, it'd be great if everyone could give a quick intro of who they are, what they're working on, and uh, maybe a brief summary of how they're using AI today in their product. Well, I'll start with Chris. Test. Hey, okay, thank you. My name is Chris Hart. I'm the CEO at Civic Technologies. Civic, um, we've been actually in the crypto space since about 2015, working on blockchain-based identity structures. And so when I say that, um, we do everything in the identity space from identity verification, um, we'll do document verification, we'll do things like IP screens, um, we also then do things that I think are particularly relevant to this discussion today around AI. So we do a proof of liveness that can be used for things like Sybil protection, bot protection, et cetera. We also do things um, like uniqueness. So uniqueness I think is particularly relevant um, for this AI talk. On the one hand, identifying who is human, i.e. proof of personhood, and at the same time, um, identifying who is not human. You know, what kind of output is generated from bots? So we work in a multi-chain, wallet agnostic way. We adhere to things like the W3C standards for decentralized identity. Um, we're a very, uh, I think, broad-based play in terms of we're on multiple blockchains, and we're really interested, I think, in the emergence of AI, how identity can play a role. I think identity is now um, sort of embedded into the crypto ecosystem, but it needs to get embedded into the AI ecosystem as well. So that's me. Amazing, thank you. So I am Lucas Martin Caldron, founder and CEO of Pentestify, and I'm also building the co-founder of uh, Web3Sec.News, a blockchain security newsletter, probably you've heard of it. Um, and what we do at Pentestify is we focus on post-deployment security, so we automatically detect smart contract vulnerabilities uh, directly from the bytecode once it's deployed. Uh, we came, however, as a company, as a firm, we were an ethical hacking company at first. We automated that process using AI, uh, so we were able to ethically pen test uh, clients, create the report, uh, have that, uh, develop that AI intuition to know which tools to use, and that is exactly what for the past uh, couple of years, two, three years, uh, we've been researching at the firm and uh, getting that software done, uh, which you will hopefully enjoy using. Great. Uh, I'm Joe Van Loon, CEO of Auditware. So we're building Audit Wizard, which is uh, an all-in-one uh, smart contract auditing platform. It's basically like an IDE with everything that an auditor, auditor could want uh, and things you don't even know that you do want. Um, so uh, the way we use AI is, uh, you know, we have a whole lot of tools that you can use to analyze code, to manage your workflow, to do threat modeling. We integrate AI into all of that to help you kind of write your reports, to um, reason about the code, to do threat modeling, to help you write proof of concepts. So we're really focused on the aspects of AI that are not just, um, you know, trying to use AI to find vulnerabilities or to do audit work for you, but how they can sort of empower you as an auditor, focusing on the things that AI is actually good at, um, and then using other tools for things that it's not so good at. Hello, my name is Lee uh, from D23E, Decentralized Intelligence. Uh, I'm a co-founder there. So our goal is to build um, the next generation of intrusion detection and prevention systems. Um, we are interested in how AI can enhance these tools so two of, two of our most recent research papers, um, one is on um, how effective auditing is, um, and the other one is using large language model to um, detect malicious transactions. Great, thanks for the background, guys. Um, so I think everyone kind of experienced like the chat GPT moment this year, where you know, I, I think underneath the surface, a lot of people have been working on AI tools for years, but this kind of brought it to the forefront. Did this change like anything about your guys' processes? Like when ChatGPT came out, were you like, oh, we have to go back to the drawing board? Or was it you know, business as usual? 
Uh, I'll say for us that uh, we kind of, when ChatGPT came out, uh, it wasn't originally kind of a, a focus for us necessarily. And it's something we kind of tried out of, uh, what if we kind of put this in our platform, see what it can do uh, and, and what it's good at and, and where it can kind of streamline things. And we saw that there was, um, there's actually a, a, a lot of things that it, that it is good at. There's definitely some things it's not good at. Like if you just give it a, a contract and you say audit this for me, it's easy to kind of discount it and say like, oh, that's not really all that, that useful. But when you like break down to the, the core components of you know, when you're doing your own audit work, what, what can it be useful for? And I think uh, looking at kind of developers and how they're leveraging it too, um, you know, using it to, as they code, just write boilerplate. We were thinking of, well, what's the boilerplate for, for auditors and where can we sort of streamline things and have that same empowerment for auditors just like, you know, how developers are, are using it. Yeah, I'm happy to take it now. Uh, for, for us, it was actually quite important as well to see uh, kind of what the focal point of the LLMs were. So every single AI, of course, has a huge bias and sometimes actually quite difficult to predict uh, what that focal point is because it convinces you that that answer is the right one instead of um, giving other alternatives in other sense detecting the tunnel vision of the of the models that make up ChatGPT uh, was actually fundamental to not only uh, verify and reinforce uh, the models that we were already using to make sure that nothing was overlapping and if it was overlapping of course to to check the quality and how much assurance how much uh, clashing there was but uh, the speaking of the focal point and tunnel vision of the AI it actually gives you clues to where the security uh, flaws, where the security vulnerabilities are going to be in the future. Because uh, definitely there might be auditors in the space that use uh, that tool to either check it or, or enhance their work. And once you've, able, you've been able to identify what that tunnel vision uh, is, it is extremely easy to uh, modify the parameters of the AI models that you can really use to specifically look for vulnerabilities in this space uh, because something that you might have taken for granted using GPT or what the code that it normally produces, in fact, um, it is easily uh, vulnerable if, again, uh, if you find that focal point that it was trained on. Yeah, I think from uh, our perspective, it was kind of a watershed moment in a couple of ways. Um, I think it's not unusual for technology to come on as AI has slowly, slowly, and then seemingly very quickly, even if for many years the technology has been under development. But what it did do was, I think, demonstrate a real shift in the zeitgeist of how people are thinking about the possibilities of AI and, in particular, AI agents. So there was a period of time where, you know, ChatGPT was clocking something like a 50 IQ. Now it's up at like 150. We started to see things emerge like the Tom Cruise deep fake and started to understand that there was gonna be tooling that would be able to spoof an identity. And then suddenly that came this LLM model and people were fascinated and I think started to dive in as I did and I'm sure everybody did to test it. And it was eerily good and I think that created questions in people's minds pretty quickly. At first it was fascinating and amazing. And then you reach this moment, you're like, wait a minute, if faces can be spoofed, if voices can be spoofed, if LLM models can get access to real-time data on the internet, and you put all of that stuff together, what is gonna happen in terms of online information and online disinformation? So from an identity perspective, this has been a really um, interesting time to live through. I think we're just at the beginning of it. Um, there is gonna be a need, I think, to regulate and put guardrails around some of this stuff. It's very exciting. I think um, people are e in equal parts excited and terrified. Uh, and probably, you know, some of that is, is um, justified on both sides. I agree 100% on that. Lee, did you, did you have anything to add to? Yep, so um, for us, I mean, the first thing that changed um, for, my, for myself is I changed my bio from security researcher to prompt engineer. Um, 
But um, as a company, right, I feel um, um, this thing has definitely um, great potential for the future, but there's also a lot of problems, I find. We do not thoroughly understand um, how effective and what's the cost. Um, I think mainly because we are lacking like a very thorough benchmark, no matter it's for auditing or it's for like um, um, finding abnormal behaviors um, in real time using large natural models. So I, I feel like we are still quite far away from um, thoroughly evaluating all the LMs and also understanding the cost um, and the limitations. Well, given this is a technical audience, um, can I have a show of hands of who's actually played with ChatGPT? All right, that's great. That's awesome. What about uh, like open source LLMs? All right. Wow. Still, still a lot of people. I'm curious if you, if you guys have like any tactical advice, kind of like in the weeds of like, what does your AI stack look like? Like, are you using ChatGPT? Are you building your own open source LLMs? Like, just as you know, some tool tools for the trade for people in the audience. Yeah, no. Uh, for to to the extent that I can that I can share, for sure, it's uh, the 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 most important thing with LLMs is if they use the transformer network, is actually where their attention is. What is that model tailored to look for attention? Uh, generally, it starts with the embeddings. So uh, an embedding, uh, it is simply a vectorized form of. Uh, a token, a word, it really depends on how the AI model is, is designed. And from that, you actually uh, start the probabilistic and statistical process of what comes next. Uh, the, the main problem with uh, ChatGPT, which is not a problem in itself, is simply what has it been tailored to. Uh, it is to predict uh, what has worked actually in the past, uh, according to academic papers, books, and so on. So by taking open source LLMs, whether it's uh, Meta's uh, LLMs or whether it's uh, you get it from Hugging Face uh, that they have been crashing it lately, uh, you have from the very beginning to tailor it to be to get the attention for vulnerabilities. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. Uh, the the other thing that all the as opposed to static analyzers, uh, dynamic and so on. Uh, which treat data most of the time as sequential data uh, or function locally function based uh, you 're able to uh, think this time in terms of graphs, which means that it is not only locally to the function it doesn 't only apply locally to the function uh, the attention so to say but you 're also going to traverse through the graph uh, through functions and actually that 's when you 're auditing manually auditing a smart contract uh, you also have to think in terms of all right, how does that function play spatially into the whole smart contract? Uh, which, from which, can I take it from behind and get into that function, you know, a way that hasn't been thought before? Um, by treating data sequentially, one of the main issues that uh, you tend to get is, is that spatial vision within the, uh, within the, uh, the, across all the functions or even across smart contracts by themselves. So uh, if, if the attention, again, from these embeddings were, uh, were successful, the graphs are going to be, that whole graph uh, is going to be and focus uh, much better on the vulnerability at hand, uh, even vulnerabilities that have not been found uh, beforehand. And then beyond that stack, uh, of course, we, we, we tend to think that it stops there, but there is a whole research into, into uh, DRLs, which is uh, deep reinforcement model agents, right? Uh, and well, uh, I could talk more about that later with pleasure, um, but it's, uh, that would be kind of the right open source way to, uh, to, to compete against tools that do an amazing job, but introduce that new category, right, without clashing or without adding anything new. So I would say that is kind of the, 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 the best way to play from, from, this, from the scratch uh, with, uh, with LLMs. Yeah, thanks. Great answer. Um, so for us, we are using primarily um, ChatGPT, um, the 32K um, API, and also um, the Claudi uh, API. So what we found in our research is the token length really matters a lot uh, when you are finding vulnerabilities. So a lot of the open source models, they do not offer uh, very big token length yet. So that's one of the, I, f I would say, deciding factor on, on picking which model to use 
uh, for for either vulnerability detection or um, detecting abnormal transactions. And I agree with uh, what Lucas just said, um, especially for like um, transaction traces, it's following a tree structure, right? So um, the current large natural model, they, they, they take a sequence of tokens as an input. So, so that's also something we still need to work on uh, in the future. Have you experimented with token compression or do you, is the 32K limit good enough for what you're doing? Um, so I haven't tried token compression, but what we do understand at the moment is um, based on our evaluation, a longer token can lead to greater um, hit rate um, and also lower false positive rates um, in finding vulnerabilities. I, I think it's hard to do token compression when you're thinking about security because you, you, you necessarily lose some information when you compress it. Um, and it's already hard enough to get the AI to focus on exactly everything that's there. Um, so you'll, you'll lose some context and if you, if you compress something that that's kind of where the vulnerability was and the, but you trimmed that out then uh, you know you kind of you kind of lose what you're what you're getting after. Um, so for for us uh, we also use uh, chat GPT and I, I think the great thing about AI as a builder is how quickly you can produce a product. Uh, literally you just need to design a prompt and there's I don't know 30 lines of code you need to write and you have a functioning uh, product but it's definitely one of those things where you can build it quickly and then iterate on it forever. Um, so I, I really like the, the aspect of AI where, you know, you can start with something basic like an LLM, but, you know, as these guys have said, that only has like a superficial context. So really the challenge then is, okay, I have my product that I've shipped quickly. How can I, how can I make it better? How can I make it more precise and, and let it go deeper? So you start looking at, uh, how can I like vectorize my my data and provide it? Like, what functions can I can I plug in to kind of add some of the things that the AI model is missing? And then you know train your your model on a graph rather than the uh, just the the language itself, so you can get deeper results. Like you can go further and further, um, you know, refining it as you go. So I think starting at the the basics of just use an LLM, figure out how to use that most effectively. Uh, and then pivot from there to something more complex, I, I think is the way I would go about it. So, so do you envision like a hybrid system where you, like, you start with chat GPT and then if you need to specialize, you pull something off the shelf from the open source world and then extend that? Or is there a way to just keep iterating with chat GPT? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I mean, you can fine tune it, but at, at the end of the day, the way chat GPT works is an LLM, right? Um, and you, you do need to look at the control flow. You need to, you need to give the, the larger context of how the code itself is working, not just the text of the code, which an LLM is never gonna be able to f uh, fully comprehend. So you, you do have to do something custom with some open source tools um, you know, to, to access the, the control, flow, control flow graph and everything. Got it. Chris, what about you guys? Yeah, um, so we're coming at it, I think, much more from a framework of how do we help attribute identity to either humans to prove that you're not um, an AI bot or an AI agent, or on the flip side, um, to try and generate um, callbacks that basically can be read on chain where there's an identity token associated with a wallet that can be read by a smart contract that then enables um, AI agents as they're accessing smart contracts to be identified in real time. So where could this be useful? For example, um, if you take a social, net social network like Twitter, we've seen a lot of problems with bots posting. Um, and in particular, I don't know if you guys followed it, um, there was uh, a pretty big uproar over the course of the last month where there was a bot who was posing as a very political polarizing figure on Twitter. Um, she was posting a lot of inflammatory rhetoric on the social network. This created a news cycle. It inflamed tensions, it inflamed passions. And so I think when we're talking about objective driven AI LLM models, where it's very easy, as these guys have pointed out, to go pick up you know, the chat GPT interface,
to cre create a graph, to create your prompt with minimal coding expertise, you can very, very quickly stand up something that's incredibly impactful and robust. And as long as those things are being used for good, all good. But unfortunately, I think we all know, you know, you guys are from the crypto ecosystem. How many mints have you participated in where a bot came in and swept the mint? How many DAOs have you had interactions with where a civil attack was attempted to tr try and drain, you know, DAO funds? So we really are thinking more about, um, less about how to integrate the LLM models and work directly with those models and rather how can we attribute identity to those things and if you take that social media um, example that I gave it would not be very hard to solve for this right so you could have a two path entry into something like a blue sky or a threads or whatever um, to try and do verification you could say look we're going to allow a certain amount of vetted known AI agents to come in and participate in the ecosystem. And you drag and drop that construct into DeFi, you know, lending, uh, real world assets, any of these things. And then second, we're going to make sure everything else coming in is a real person. And so I think, you know, at Civic, what we're thinking about a lot is that proof of personhood and then also that proof of AI for, for lack of a better term um, right now. Yeah, you touched on something really interesting where I think we're in this world now where it's like bots are usually bad and humans are usually good. And there's probably a world where that flips where like bots are people too. And do you think that requires us to like design protocols in a different way where it's just like if the bot's doing good work on the platform, maybe you just encourage it and they do get to participate in airdrops. Well, I'll, I'll say quickly, um, I think provenance is, is really important and being able to attribute ownership back to these things is essential because I think you're dead right. Um, at some point in time, and, and I think people will be shocked how fast this happens, you're going to have an AI agent operating on your behalf. And, you know, it's, it's Jarvis from the Marvel movies, however you want to think about it. It's going to be out there doing things for you, you know, booking tickets, making sure bills get paid, um, making sure that you know, whatever news delivery service you have is coming through, like whatever the things are, and there'll be a whole host of things that these agents are doing, they're gonna need to interact in the real world on your behalf, and you want that. You should want that. That is a future that I think we all know is coming, and it's actually not that far away, maybe not months, but certainly years. And so I think it does change the way that the interaction with the protocol level um, is gonna actually need to materialize. And this is, you know, I know we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the marriage of AI and crypto, but to me, this is where it gets really interesting because distrib distributed ledger technology, by its very nature, is good at some things, it's terrible for other things, okay, I think we know that. But DLT, I think, and generally blockchain identity attestations have a few advantages. It's distributed. There is no sort of um, one arbiter or owner of the identities on chain. If I've gone through and proved I am who I say I am with a passport, and there's an on-chain attestation that's privacy preserving, and then I want to delegate that attestation to my AI agent so that it can operate on my behalf, then I should be able to do that, and smart contracts that are gating access to these things should be able to read that. So I think it is foundational. Um, it's actually very fortuitous in my mind that DLT and crypto has made as much progress as it has, at this time when we have a really good use case with AI, and in particular, identity and AI, I think is gonna be crucial to get right. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, we have a saying internally that like AI is like offensive technology and crypto is defensive, and sort of like you need the marriage of those two. Um, and this touches on what you were hinting at earlier is like regulation. And so we have like government regulation, but then also potential crypto regulation, like how, how can we use crypto to regulate DeFi agents? So uh, there's a, an EIP like 7265 around circuit breakers. How do you all think like circuit breakers will manifest with AI? Like once you get an AI agent going, like how do, how do we shut it down if it, if it goes rogue? You know, I think uh, the, the EIP, the, the, the newest one that recently proposed, um, that already happened. I think a good framework to know how can these things work out at the end is looking at has what has worked in Web 2, 
because at the end of the day, it's just going to be uh, a similar wave in terms of movements, in terms of how things um, settle down and, and so on. So with, uh, I do agree that bots, whether it is something that we want or not, uh, there is something extremely important called attribution, being able to watermark um, what comes from, from an AI and what doesn't, uh, being able to, to hold hostage one AI, which in return it's able to hold hostage the users. Uh, in some very limited uh, scenarios in banks, for example, that already happens, where AI can have the uh, last call, uh, those are AIs that have been audited every single line, but it wouldn't be a new concept that um, an AI can actually take last minute decisions. And with, uh, with this new proposal, actually, they're very, um, the objective of that proposal is for people at the end of the day to trust uh, DeFi more. So that means uh, you're not able to get a rug pull and lose all your funds, but rather uh, when there is a breach, that whole breach happens way slower than what would otherwise happen in, in, in around a couple of hours. And you would be able to uh, either take notice, fix the problem in the meantime, but of course you don't have the right to choose and to, to choose to get your funds, which is something that I do understand people are against. Um, however, it still remains the fact that everything will be um, readable online and you will know exactly what that AI or circuit breaker or whatever implementation they decide to pull, you will know what the consequences of that are. Again, it is still open and the, uh, the objective of it is once there is trust, enough trust to bootstrap that DeFi application or that bank um, to slowly take that circuit breaker off. Um, that's already worked extremely well in finance. Uh, it happened once in a line time in the NASDAQ that that circuit breaker was activated and actually saved uh, a lot of companies, billions of dollars. So I do think even though it takes freedom out of the user, maybe that user would have less freedom with um, without the voting rights, the tokens, or whatever is racked at that time. So, uh, so I see that generally as a good implementation to begin the trust, uh, as long as it is, of course, readable, e everyone can know exactly and predict how it's gonna work. Um, and there is, and there is a, very, a very clear decentralization in the way of, of how it works, instead of simply being a small multisig that uh, we all know how that ends up. True. <laughs> so, like, just parroting it back a bit. So, you you think AI being the final arbiter of the circuit breaker is probably how things will play out as opposed to, to humans? I do think in very particular cases that would be the case. Highly audited AI uh, where the result is not as... Because the problem with AI or the fears with AI is how stochastic could it be? How uh, And there is, there is such AI that has deterministic... Um, outputs as well. Again, it all depends on the model. There are thousands of different infrastructures, models, uh, sensory inputs and sensory outputs. So, so I do believe the, the, the right deterministic one would be, uh, could be an option for the future and would end up happening, yeah. Interesting. I guess that's not that different from um, what happens now. You know, quant systems and algorithmic trading at the end of the day is deterministic, right? I mean, it's making a call based on criteria. We're just now saying this AI agent, provided there's appropriate audit and guardrails around it, should have an equal set of opportunity to be that last um, decision maker in that tree. Is that the way you think about it? Yeah, to, to be honest, I do think it is not foolish to expect similar things that happen in Web2 and that have worked very well in Web2 to repeat themselves in Web3, especially taking advantage of what the blockchain is made for to decentralize the settlements. So uh, I do think we will end up seeing uh, some sort of high frequency trading uh, in, in DeFi, even though uh, at this current moment, because of the speeds and the gas, it doesn't seem very feasible. But I would, yeah, I would definitely see that repeating in Web3 and in Web4 uh, if it works very well in Web3. Um, I, I do want to add a few like uh, quantitative data uh, from our previous research. Mm. So we had a paper where we collected like uh, roughly 160 DeFi incidents 
and we evaluated um, the emergency pause mechanisms um, in these DeFi protocols. And we surprisingly found out that only one of the protocols who supports the emergency pause has actually triggered the pause within one hour. And roughly 42%, I think, of the, of the protocols paused within six hours. So, so there are certain challenges with the circuit breaker designs if we do not use like automated tools, right? Because DeFi, there's no market um, like pause, right? It's a 24 seven market. Uh, it's quite expensive for DeFi projects to have a dedicated team to monitor transactions 24 seven on chain. So I feel there must be some automated way to detect malicious transactions and trigger the pause. But the problem with heuristics of traditional tools is they only, like someone needs to design the patterns, right? Um, and the attackers will probably figure out a way to bypass the patterns to create an innovative way to kind of steal the money. And what's good with AI is um, they can find out um, abnormal patterns um, by comparing transactions with the historical transactions. So no matter um, if the heuristics captures it or not, it's very likely AI can capture in the future um, all these abnormal behaviors. That's something I want to add on top. Yeah, interesting. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that it can be a double-edged sword. I mean, I, I think it's definitely necessary. Um, like in the Web2 world, when you think about security, you always have all this time to respond to something. Um, and all these like indicators that someone's you know breaking into uh, your stuff, but in the Web three world, things happen quite quickly. Um, and, you know, a as these guys have said, you, it's really hard to have that be a manual effort where you're kind of monitoring your contracts and then you respond to something that's happening because an attacker may be able to to finish their attack completely by the time you even notice, right? So you you definitely need something automated, um, and I think AI could be a, a good fit for that. But when you when you think about it, um, you're adding a circuit breaker, you're, you're also adding another avenue for attack. Like if um, you're, a, an attacker can somehow trigger that circuit breaker, they can you know, DOS your, your, your product, right? They can shut it down for a bit. Um, so you wanna have that responsiveness to stop an attack, but you also want to not introduce uh, avenues for um, an attacker to uh, uh, essentially mock a, a pattern that's going to trick the AI into triggering the circuit breaker. So I, I think it's something you have to approach really carefully because uh, it, could, it could end up hurting you in the long run. Yeah, it's like the classic who watches the watchman problem. Um, maybe uh, well, we have five minutes left, but I'm, I'm curious like, if we look forward to like, the future world where we have like, a perfect researcher AGI that's just like monitoring all the contracts, monitoring all transactions, like, if you had to estimate today, when, when do you think something like that would exist? Is it a year away, two years, five years, never? Um, curious where people land there. Well, I'm probably gonna get a bit of heat on, but um, the, the, the good news with this is that I do not think it would be an AGI. At the end of the day, um, true intelligence comes from when, when you're not specialized at anything, and yet you can abstract certain things that are specific to a certain topic or matter, uh, and you're able to implement that elsewhere, or you're able to use the skills that you already have, the general skills that you have to create that, or to look into something that might create that better than you do. Therefore, I, I do not think the AGI in this case would be the answer, but rather an AGI to which uh, many specific protocols, and again, that would be us. Um, we would create specific AIs uh, that are attentive to very specific things. Um, I do believe in the um, composability of it all, so that, uh, let's say, for example, our brain could understand very well how to type, but we don't have the uh, mobility intelligence um, to, to type just with our brain. We need our arm, right? So the, the arms, our extensions in this case, would be highly specialized uh, artificial intelligence protocols that use uh, different sensitive uh, and, and sensory inputs, uh, such as, for example, we talk a lot about agents, and agents in AI mean several things. Could come from an LLM agent that is able to select the right tool for the task, 
or it could simply come from an agent that receives the feedback from the critic in the case of reinforcement learning, right? So having those very specific AIs that pay attention to one single thing, um, there was even a paper on Google on attentionally sold you need, um, for for all of, the, uh, all of you that um, would like to read that, that was the basics, the origin of ChatGPT. Um, and I, I do not think there would be, uh, it goes against the concept of being general to being sp specified in one thing. So um, to, unfortunately for uh, Sam Altman, uh, the artificial, the general artificial intelligence wouldn't be able to control it all because uh, it would be general by nature, it would be us who in the field have developed a specific and specialized tool that is able to precisely look into one very uh, core thing. So I do think that's gonna be the dynamics around the future more than simply having an AGI that, um, uh, that replaces us all. Just um, maybe one thing to add and, and a question on top of that. On the one hand, the monitoring, I think you're right, is gonna be this very specialized, focused, attentive model. On the other hand, um, it seems like the the bad actors or, or even just the trading firms are going to be incentivized to do something much more general. They're going to be scraping sentiment analysis from Twitter, from Facebook, from LinkedIn. They're going to be looking at trading patterns. They're going to be trying to compile all that into some deterministic action. And so on the one hand, we can have very controlled models, but if they're very dynamic, aggressive, and smart models on the other side, I think it's a bit of an arms race and maybe a uh, we're bringing the wrong weapon. Yeah I, yeah, I don't think we can help uh, not bringing the wrong weapon. Uh, but if, for example, all the open source protocols out there were developed with watermark identification, uh, if it's not recognized in, uh, within the watermark database, for example, it would be an AI that might be rogue. Um, so being able to, um, especially, uh, especially with ZK, which is something we didn't touch upon, but um, if you're able to verify what you're using on chain and you know exactly that the AI is doing exactly what you said it would do, uh, that, that way you would be able to have that verification on chain. Sure, you could trust uh, certain AIs that haven't been verified and are, uh, are not wrongly intentioned, but I do think ZK will be here to help out in that verification uh, on chain um, for all those things, heavy computations uh, of chain. B or Joe, any final comment on the specialized versus AGI? Yeah, um, I'm not sure that an AGI is absolutely necessary to, um, you know, extract maximum value uh, out of the, the crypto space. Like w w the way I see the future is kind of like how we have uh, MEV bots now, like MEV, right? So um, there's this arms race to extract a maximum value out of every transaction. And I think we're gonna start seeing that in terms of security as well, right? So AI is gonna kind of empower those to be more abstract, more generalized, so that even a, a strategy someone hasn't thought of, um, once it kind of, the opportunity exists on chain, uh, an AI can, a specialized AI can kind of uh, come up with a way to extract that value. And I think we'll see security kind of bundled in there as well. I think within the, the next decade, we're gonna start seeing this problem pop up where um, security is almost like an instant finality on chain, right? Like you deploy your project, people start using it, and immediately, if it's vulnerable, it's gonna be hacked by some uh, AI Absolutely. that's just yeah. monitoring the chain. Yeah. Awesome. Um, We're at time, but um, we could probably talk for another hour on this easy. Uh, so if you have questions for these guys, um, uh, please go find them um, walking the hallways. Thanks everybody for showing up. Thank you.